this morning slash afternoon, oh, good. depending on time zone of where you are. <laughs> morning for me. <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. And um, thank you for joining part of this series of conversations I'm having with people at uh, Middlebury College and the Institute who wrote about, attended, worked on, planned, facilitated meetings uh, at COP26. You did an amazing thing there. You were the all-essential interpreter. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. Um, Talk Um, a little bit about more what brought you to interpreting and what brought you to COP26 as an interpreter, please. Um, yeah, so I joined Miss last year. This is my second year. And I started a bit more focused on translation, I think. But over the first course of my first year, especially having two languages, I definitely got more involved in interpreting and found it more exciting. So I'm a conference interpretation student now and just focusing on that. And I'm really enjoying it so far. And at the and for COP, yeah, yeah, I heard about it through one of my teachers, Christiana Bell, and um, she gave us the information for it, and it it worked out. It seemed like a really good opportunity, so I took advantage of it. Was it what you expected? Um, for the most part, yeah, I think I've, you know, I've been pretty well prepared through this program, but it was definitely different from what we do in class. It was cool to do things and do something in the real world where it's not so much trying to be perfect and um, yeah, working through all of the little things with your classmates and professors, but just actually facilitating conversation for people and allowing them to connect was a very different mindset to have with it and a very different experience. I'm curious the balance as an interpreter between what the speaker, is it speaker and hearer? Are those the proper terms to use? Listener? What are the terms? I want to make sure I'm using the correct ones. Um, well, in the the main thing that I did in COP, they were both speakers. It was an interview, so I was just facilitating their conversation. So I guess, yeah. Both speakers. Um, yeah, if it's like a conference, then I, it would be the, the speaker and the audience. Or the listeners, yeah. So you would hear, if uh, this is my basic understanding of what interpreting is, you hear someone say something, your mind processes it into a different language, and then you repeat it, Not is it the repeating word for word or idea for idea to another speaker? It's definitely more idea to idea. There's a lot of de-verbalization that has to happen. Um, and... Yeah, that's in, that's simultaneous interpretation where you're it is sort of processing it in the moment. Um, for COP, I did mostly consecutive interpretation, so I was taking notes and doing short segments of their conversation. And there, it's even your minutes down the road from what they said, so you've you verbalized it as much as you can and are just yeah giving the, the essence back or the full the full content of what they said, but have to move away from the source a bit. That seems like the the sort of artistic part of it is to make sure that you are accurately conveying the ideas in a way that the other speaker would be able to be a part of the conversation. Yeah, it's definitely a lot to balance, making sure you're speaking idi- idiomatically in the, the target language and also getting as many details as you can. Um, how Definitely. was there i mean of course at cop 26 this is like f- planning for the future of the world did you feel the weight of the importance of the conference and the summit during your work um a little bit um the main conversation that i um facilitated was between a haitian activist so it did it felt very significant there because he wasn't actually able to go to the conference so this was he was speaking with a newspaper about why he wasn't able to come and why it's important that voices like his are heard young people from developing nations that are the most affected so it was definitely significant to be able to share his message especially since he and many other people from Haiti and countries like him had visa issues and weren't able to go. So, is it what's the process in your mind to detach your emotions 
from the work that you're doing? Um, it's mindfulness definitely helps. I know Julie Johnson does a course on that and there's so much going on when you're interpreting. It's not get, letting the nerves get the best of you and especially when it's a more sensitive subject like this, it's, you definitely have to be able to keep your cool. Not that I'm always able to, but. <laughs> you seem pretty cool and mild mannered now. It's, I'm wondering like if, if the, it, it, in the hypothetical interpretation scenario, someone's like really, really angry at the other person, but then you have to, you have to be a filter of that passion and emotion mm -hmm. before you transfer it on and go back and forth. Yeah, I've actually we've talked we were talking about that in one of my classes recently. Like you, the interpreter is supposed to sort of blend into the background and not be the star of the show. Um, so especially when there's big strong emotions being thrown around. You want to portray it a bit, but you don't want to be pounding your fists on the desk and yelling if the diplomat or speaker is, but you want to portray like that's part of their message. So still, you know, speaks firmly and show that that emotion is there without flying off the handle. Because that's a big part of language, of coding the reality to someone who you're trying to communicate with is, I feel very important about this. I'm choosing a different tone, a different volume, a different physical stance, a different vocabulary. And the thing that you mentioned a little earlier that makes me think along those lines is the idiomatic and choosing a different idiom for something of, you know, I pick up the cup versus I grabbed the cup versus I, you know, yanked the cup and finding, uh, is that sort of the work that you get to do as an interpreter is choose those idioms to reflect the intent? Definitely. Yeah. You, you get to choose the language that you're, that you're giving out and that's, that's part of deverbalizing it from the original source. Like there's no pure synonym and there's no 100%, well, sometimes there's a 100% right word, of course, but there is a lot of leeway where you can um, make sure that you're saying things properly. But with a lot of emotion like that, like that's not something that you need to act out. Like, especially if you're interpreting between two people in a room, they're even if they don't understand each other's language they're going to see the emotion that that person is giving off so you don't need to necessarily you know use swear words or etc if that person is interesting um so at the an extreme extreme example but <laughs> no no that's a, that's a perfect example i think that's right along the lines that that's really interesting to think about the work that you do cuz when we see fictionalized interpreters is always you know very you know, straight laced and matter of fact, but there's all of that uh, emotion that comes when people get together in the same room. So this this particular project that you did at COP26 between the activist and the journalist um, interpreting between there, when you see the finished product, the the article, the story, or the blog post, whatever the 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 writer was doing, and you see the quotes in there, are the quotes your interpretation of the activist's words? For the most part, I don't think they're word for word. When I looked through it, I didn't think it was exactly what I said. But so she again took her um, artistic liberty as I um, to perfect what I said, because I'm still a learning interpretation student. What I say isn't going to be the most beautiful English ever on the spot. Um, but it was it was pretty much what I said and the ideas that he was expressing. So it definitely was. Pretty, pretty much what I was saying. So I had a... Uh, being, she maybe perfected it. Uh, they just were like, no, we'll nuance that a little bit. We'll, we'll make it... Um, a conference interpreter, that's a very specific... You're going to travel the world? Is that a, one of your goals, to sort of go everywhere? And once, you know, pandemic is <laughs> normalized and we can travel more? Why a conference yeah. interpreter for you, Julia? Why did that interest you so much? I hope so. I definitely travel was definitely a big thing that gotten in, got me into this and always being a big language dork and loving exploring new cultures. So I'm hoping that through conference interpretation that will open up doors for me to be able to incorporate that into my career and the rest of my life. Uh, was COP26, um, after you got, you finished your work on the project, did you feel that you'd made a difference, that you had, that you had helped and contributed? Yeah, in my in my small way, I was glad I was able to 
facilitate that conversation and help young activist voices be heard. I think that's a most important part of that conference like that's where the real work is going to be done i mean in a way no absolutely i think that the the younger the activist the more at stake the, the things are like they are the ones that are going to be living in a world far beyond what, what the, whatever the climate crisis wreaks on us as as humans yeah my last little thank you so much for taking some time today my last question for you is this is something that i have had to learn and you must be so frustrated sometimes as a student the difference between interpretation and translation <laughs> and how often those words get switched is there anything you would yes. say to people who hear that to so that they can keep in mind clearly between interpretation and translation yeah, that is definitely a common mistake. It <laughs> doesn't bother me. I get it. I didn't know the difference um, a few years ago. Um, but yeah, so translation just means it's written and interpretation is uh, spoken. So that is simple. So that now knowing that, and when I watch the TV Make show, simple, yeah. <laughs> when I see, see, see the television show Star Trek and they have the universal translator, I'm like, no, that's the universal interpreter. <laughs> Yeah, it does start to bug you once you get into the world of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations on your work with COP. Best of luck on all your studies throughout this year. You're graduating next year, next spring, is that right? 2022 from Yeah, Ms. next spring. Um, <laughs> we may check in again now that I've got your contact information. Thank you so much. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much for your time as well. I'm going to end the stream. Keep on Discord for a moment. We'll say goodbye, and then we'll log off. Perfect. Thank you.